The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up! The Richet structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the rich hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on, and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. 
It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedscallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's of course a legend behind this mystery too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks, yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Leh wow. City, India, where instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes, yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help but notice that many mysterious things on Earth involve stones or rocks or methane. Which one of these phenomena is your favorite? Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony, and this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? to uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. 
However, when night came, it became extremely cold, reaching temperatures as low as minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. Recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up, Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, it's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called micro -seisms. It's like the earth's own heartbeat felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still. It's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the earth.
But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, languages spoken in high altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and Ka, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So, why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds. But scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. So, the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. There are many miles of undiscovered areas beneath the crust we can't even come close to. Scientists found what appears to be underground mountains buried inside the mantle. Our planet is divided into three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust is where 8 billion people, trillions of trees, and millions of animals live and thrive. There are also different types of crust in the land and the ocean. The oceanic crust contains unique rocks and is denser than the land crust. We all see how the Earth is divided and color-coded to show the crust, mantle, and core in textbooks. But there are also special layers in between that not everyone talks about. The mantle is divided into the upper and lower part, which is the transition zone. Since the mantle acts as the geological recycling center, the plate tectonics don't only move side to side, but up and down. It's actually why all the volcanoes appeared. The magma spews out to the surface or even underwater and then sinks back down and repeats. The transitions go down 250 miles and then 410 miles. And in this bottom layer, scientists keep discovering the hidden landscapes. The mountains in the mantle are more rugged and much larger than the ones on the crust. Scientists found a mountain range with peaks higher than Mount Everest. Some of them are as high as 600 miles. When the continents were still landlocked together, there may have been some hidden lands now underwater. Theories suggest that Iceland used to be part of a larger microcontinent, Icelandia, which connected present-day Iceland with Greenland and Scandinavia. The idea digs even deeper to a greater Icelandia which includes Britain. But after the split, these bigger lands sunk with everything in it. There are also theories about New Zealand being part of Zealandia, a hidden microcontinent within the same region. So it could be that these mountains used to be part of old Earth that are underground over the billions of years of natural occurrences, but still it isn't very likely. One theory is that these underground mountain ranges could be leftover slabs of rock that descended from the surface to the transition zone from the moving of the tectonic plates. As they sink, the large pieces break down into smaller ones, and as they compile over the millions of years, 
they form what appears to be underground mountains. Since the mantle is the geologic recycling zone, it's likely that the rocks down there used to be part of the surface. They weren't large pieces of land that got hidden, just like dogs hide bones in the garden. But it takes way more time to hide mountains. Some parts of the mantle appear to be smooth, while others aren't so much. The parts that have a cluster of rocks could contain hidden elements in the underground mountains. The smoother parts don't have much seismic or volcanic activity, while the rough parts do. The best way to study those underground landscapes is to wait for an earthquake or a volcano eruption to happen. Seismologists can observe the Earth's interior with special scanners, just like doctors use ultrasound to examine a patient. They can even see minor details and not huge chunks of rocks. A strong enough earthquake can send shock waves to the Earth's interior, even through the core and back up to the surface. Depending on where they occur, seismologists can observe and study the intensity of the waves as they move back and forth. On smooth rocks, the waves can travel in a straight line, but once they reach a rough area, the waves tend to scatter. The temperature and composition of the materials can make the waves move faster or slower. But this info isn't exactly accurate and won't contribute a lot to the actual data of the underground mountains. So by analyzing the scattered waves on ships and utilizing the Earth's magnetic field, scientists can figure out everything they need to know. But these studies are only good enough to figure out the interior in today's state not how the Earth changed over the past 4.5 billion years. However, scientists are certain that mantle material still dates back to the beginning of Earth's original formation. The question, why not just dig a hole to the center of the Earth and see what's going on down there, might seem logical. The deepest hole humans have dug so far is the Kola Deep Borehole in the Russian Arctic that goes more than 40,000 feet deep. The locals claim they can actually hear screaming coming from below. It took almost 20 years to drill as far as they went, but it's literally merely scratching the surface of what's underneath. They dug about one-third of the crust, which is only 0.2% to the center of the Earth. Getting there is beyond us, just like trying to reach the sun. No human can handle the amount of pressure down there. Going down the Mariana Trench, the Earth's deepest point, requires special gear to withstand all the immense pressure. It'll cost a fortune to build that tech to get us to the center of our planet. Evidence of diamonds buried deep in Brazil shows that everything we do on the crust's surface can affect things miles below, even towards the mantle. Scientists dug up six diamonds that could hold tiny mineral grains. As they're called in the mineral world, these inclusions have a chemistry composition where they originated deep in the Earth. Typical diamonds are formed at depths less than 125 miles in the upper mantle, where it's extremely hot. The high pressure and boiling temperature down crystallizes carbon and creates diamonds. But humans can't dig all the way down there. They mine them by detecting where a deep volcanic eruption happened that expelled these diamonds to the surface. These eruptions occurred millions of years ago, when dinosaurs used to rule the Earth. They shot out the diamonds that were in the mantle and are now embedded within the cooled down volcanic material. That's where people mine them. But these special diamonds found in Brazil originated from a much deeper point than usual, which can further help scientists study the depths of the Earth. They can extract these inclusions and analyze them in a lab to tell where exactly these minerals come from. In the lab, scientists study inclusions, each just 15 to 40 microns wide, less than a quarter width of a human hair. They found out that they contained many types of minerals found in volcanic rock on the surface. The carbon composition of the magma from the surface is much different than the ones deep in the Earth. What's crazy is that these diamonds with special inclusions can only be found 435 miles in the lower mantle. With only a few samples of them found, we don't know what else lies beneath us. It's possible that those mountain ranges underground, taller than Mount Everest, can have traces of diamonds all around, which would prompt excavators to dig them up and saturate the market with them. These diamonds are less flawed than the usual ones and might even come in many sizes. It's possible to see diamonds as large as a car or as small as a grain of rice. 
There might even be new diamonds with different chemical compositions than the ones we find near the surface. The largest diamond in the world is the Cullinan, which can fit in the palm of your hand. It weighs around 1.3 pounds and is 3,100 carats. It was found in 1905 in South Africa. For anything to exist on Earth, you need carbon. In a nutshell, the carbon cycle is when plants and algae release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or dissolved in water through photosynthesis. It's converted into carbohydrates and stored as fat. Later on, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere through breathing, which the plants benefit from, and the cycle goes on. Scientists claim that there might even be a carbon cycle in Earth's interior. The oceanic crust has a lot of carbon sediment that could mix with the upper and lower mantle layer. But there still isn't enough evidence to support this. The deep diamonds might be the key to popping open that theory. Only time will tell.